We are your hosts, Nikki Shore and Jesse Swain, and you are listening to the American Journal of Infection Control podcast, Science into Practice, brought to you by the Association for Professionals in Infection Control and Epidemiology to highlight work published in our peer-reviewed journal, AHIC. Join us as we speak to those in the field of infection prevention and control, like us, as well as other experts to learn about some of the latest research in the field and how it can be put into practice. We hope you will listen in, learn something new, and apply this information to your work. If you are not a researcher already, we hope this podcast will get you thinking about areas where you can carry out your own research. Hello again, everyone. I'm Jesse Swain, and I'm happy to be back as always to talk about another recent study, Healthcare Worker Feedback on Duodenoscope Reprocessing Workflow and Ergonomics. Here with me today to talk about the team's research is Aaron Sparnon. Aaron Sparnon is a Senior Engineering Manager in the Device Evaluation Group at ECRI and an independent nonprofit organization dedicated to improving the safety, quality, and cost-effectiveness of care across all healthcare settings worldwide. In this role, she leads a team of engineers and analysts in the testing and evaluation of medical devices, as well as accident and forensic investigations involving device failures. The team includes Dr. Amanda Civic, principal investigator on a landmark survey of ergonomic issues related to duodenoscope reprocessing. Ms. Sparnon also provides consulting services for hospitals and health systems and coordinates with national organizations on safety initiatives related to medical devices, electronic health records, and health information technology. Thanks so much for being here today with us, Erin. Thanks. I'm looking forward to talking with you. Fantastic. So to begin our conversation, can you give a description of duodenoscopes and how they're used for those of us that are not familiar? Sure, duodenoscopes are a type of endoscope designed to reach and treat a very specific anatomy. They're inserted through the mouth and threaded down through the stomach into the first part of your small intestine, the duodenum, and hence the name. And we use them to diagnose and treat problems in the liver and gallbladder, bile ducts, and pancreas. In order to do their job, these scopes have a really complex design. The devices have long, narrow channels for tools to be threaded through and an elevator or a lifter at the end that the user can activate to redirect a biopsy forceps or catheter right up into the bile ducts. Unfortunately, this complexity can make duodenoscopes really difficult to reprocess correctly, which we'll get into later. So Erin, what types of healthcare facilities are using and reprocessing these scopes? ERCP procedures can be performed in both hospitals and outpatient care centers like physician offices or clinics, and there are more than 500,000 of these procedures performed in the United States every year. And of course, each and every one of those facilities performing them will need to have access to both the staff and the workspace to reprocess and store their scopes. That's interesting. So clearly we're doing a lot of these procedures and there's a lot of these scopes out there. Can you tell us then what prompted the particular research that your team did and what your team was trying to find out? Sure. Uh, Duodenoscopes are both uniquely tough to pre-process and they're also very good at passing on pathogens if that reprocessing isn't done correctly. Like any endoscope, duodenoscopes have long working channels or tubes that you use to get the tools down to the end of the scope. Cleaning and drying these channels is like a much harder version of trying to clean and dry the straw and innards of your kid's water bottle before it grows mold. And then duodenoscopes are unique in the endoscope world due to their elevator mechanisms, which provide plenty of nooks and crannies for bio burden and pathogens to hide in. Duodenoscope reprocessing is a complex process that includes so many different steps. So first there's pre-cleaning to remove soil, leak testing, and visual inspection, then a manual cleaning step, rinsing out the cleaning agents, and then high-level disinfection and alcohol flush. You can do that by an endoscope reprocessor device, or you can do sterilization with ethylene oxide gas. Then you have to track that the scope has been sent through that high-level disinfection, dry the scope, and then store it in a specialized cabinet that keeps it clean and ready for use. This usually adds up to over 100 individual tasks, and if any one part of this process is done incorrectly, or if steps are skipped, the patients can be at risk. 
ECRI has been covering the patient safety hazards of ineffective duodenoscope reprocessing for years, and it's a recurring topic for our annual Top 10 Health Technology Hazards list. Clinical literature has reported so many duodenoscope-associated outbreaks caused by virulent multidrug-resistant organisms. I remember the wave of CRE outbreaks news back in 2015, and the U.S. Food and Drug Administration has issued several safety communications about reprocessing, including a recommendation to shift to some newer models with single-use components. Those can cut down on some of those hundred-some tasks of reprocessing. But facilities can't swap out all of their scopes for these newer models overnight. So we knew that duodenoscope reprocessing is an absolutely critical process that must be done right each and every time. But we couldn't find any information about the specific experiences and challenges of the healthcare workers who are responsible for carrying out this work. Most studies either surveyed people who didn't actually perform the tasks, like physicians, or asked about general endoscopy reprocessing instead of duodenoscopes in particular. Because pre-cleaning and manual cleaning are the most labor-intensive tasks in the process, we focused on finding the workers responsible for these tasks, which include endoscopy nurses and technicians or technologists in endoscopy, high-level disinfection, and sterile processing departments. I love that description of trying to clean out a children's water bottle because those things are so hard to clean. And I feel like oftentimes I end up throwing them out because you can't get them clean. So that's pretty perfect. Uh, I know. And the scopes are tens of thousands of dollars. So that's just not an option. Yeah, absolutely. So I also like that key point about how when you're surveying a group of people about particular questions related to a process that they're doing, you want the people that are actually doing the process. So to me, asking a physician would would be the, the wrong population of people to ask. So as your team was developing the questions for the survey, how did they come up with the questions and how was this survey then executed to get the right population? Sure, our principal investigator, Dr. Amanda Civic, developed three goals for the study in conjunction with experts from both ECRI and also the FDA. So first, we wanted to assess the time spent for staff to complete the pre-cleaning and manual cleaning of reusable duodenoscopes. Second, to find the human factors issues in duodenoscope reprocessing workflow and also the ergonomics of the work environment. And then third, to find any best practices in duodenoscope reprocessing or key issues that can be shared with healthcare facilities. In order to meet these three goals, we developed and disseminated a confidential qualitative self-reported survey that included eight demographic questions followed by either or both of the surveys on pre-cleaning and or workflow. To find the right people, we had to cast a very wide net. We emailed over a thousand contacts at acute care facilities, outpatient endoscopy centers, and health systems in the United States. We also had help from the Endoscope Reprocessing Certification Organization, the Healthcare Sterile Processing Association, who distributed the unrestricted survey link to their relevant members. That's amazing. It sounds like that was a, a really great way to find and cover a lot of people that are working out there with these endosco- or duodenoscopes. So... In reviewing the article, it sounded like the three most difficult duodenoscope reprocessing phases identified by the respondents were manual cleaning, pre-cleaning, and drying. Is there any indication as to why these three uh, processes stood out? Sure. So I said before that pre-cleaning and manual cleaning are really labor-intensive tasks, but they also require a lot of lifting and extended reaching and manipulation of the scope and tools like brushes to get into all the right spots. And there's also just so many steps, 18 to 23 for pre-cleaning and 60 to 85 steps for manual cleaning, depending on the model of scope. Drying the scopes involves pushing clean air through the working channels until you're sure that no moisture remains. And again, each and every step and task has to be done just right in order to keep patients safe. Wow. 60 to 85 steps. That's just out of this world. I don't know that I could ever remember to do all of those. So 
The study also identifies that one of the top contributing factors to reduced pre-cleaning and manual cleaning effectiveness was time pressure. And we all have time pressure, right? So in this case, is there any solution for these time pressures? Sure, there were some be several best practices that kind of bubbled up from the results that we found. So, I mean, it should surprise no one that if we need faster, more accurate work, we need comfortable staff working at the top of their game. And what we're hearing is that means that we need to train and mentor reprocessing staff until they're comfortable with all those hundred plus tasks involved. Then provide them with easy to read instructions and checklists to reinforce their knowledge and then retain those experienced staff because they are worth their weight in gold. Also, we need to make sure they, those staff have whatever specialized tools like brushes or air blowers or storage cabinets that they need to get the job done safely. We need to give them a safe and well-lit workspace with enough room to perform their tasks. And also accomplishing all this might need a bit of a shift in culture if we're not already emphasizing the critical nature of this work and the skill required to do it right each and every single time. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And, you know, we hear this over and over again that happy staff are productive, you know, people that are getting the job done right. So when we think about how we do our work, it is critical to consider the environment. And it was intriguing that ergonomics was such a big consideration in the study and how it potentially affected the cleaning and disinfection of the scopes. So were there any conclusions drawn from the responses from the survey about body discomfort while performing this work? Yes, the majority of respondents reported that cleaning duodenous scopes caused fatigue or discomfort in one or more of their body parts, particularly in the lower back, necks, and shoulders. This is likely related to our other finding that uncomfortable height work surfaces like carts and counters and sinks and small cramped cleaning areas contribute to the difficulty of cleaning scopes and also, therefore, to the reduced effectiveness in manual cleaning tasks. That makes a lot of sense. And I, I, I wonder if when, you know, these areas that this work is being done in were actually um, developed and designed, if maybe ergonomics wasn't actually taken into consideration. It's possible. I mean, the, the instructions for use, you know, may have grown out of a desire to, of course, keep patients safe by by uh, making really, really sure that no bio burden and pathogens remain. But, you know, 60 to 80 steps to get the job done seems like an awful lot. And consider, too, you know, what if your facility is handling several brands of scope with slightly different instructions? So things like checklists and graphics and other memory aids are absolutely a great idea for helping in times of stress. So if there's high production pressure and especially for tasks that are performed often, and they'll definitely work best if they're readily available in the workspace, if they're reinforced in regular refresher training, if they're provided in the languages your staff are most comfortable using, and if you regularly check them against your device's instruction for use to keep up with any changes in the procedures or tools or technologies. Yeah, that's that's amazing advice. I the the part of the study talking about memory load um, that stuck out to me too. Thinking about as you mentioned the sixty to eighty five steps. I I don't know how any it would be possible for anyone to to just have that in their head readily available and not miss a step. Um. So having all of the checklists and refreshers and things like that available, in addition to IFUs, knowing that there are for different types of scopes, there's different IFUs. So when you're thinking about reprocessing, you have to think about which one you're reprocessing. It's, it's a lot of information to have in your head. And also thinking about staffing. So we're, we know that in healthcare, we've been really struggling with staffing shortages. So what are some of the things that facilities can do to encourage longevity in these skilled sterile pro reprocessing technicians? Sure. So along with the usual tools for staff engagement and retention, like competitive wages, educational and certification opportunities, and pathways for advancement, reprocessing workers need a few things in particular. So first and foremost, they need respect for performing a mission-critical task. Just like their clinical peers, if their job goes wrong, patients can be hurt. 
And you might not know about errors or breakdowns in the process until you spot patients coming in with unusual or multi-drug resistant infections. They need a safe and bright and welcoming ergonomic work area that minimizes the physical discomfort that comes from reaching and grasping and trying to get pieces into the right spots. They need regular data about their performance and also a voice in performance improvement activities. And they really need management that listens and closes communication loops. One example of that might be team building between the operating room and a sterile processing department. I really like that, the team building. That's great because they do work so closely together. That's great. So are there any key points that you would like to leave the listeners with today? Yes, uh, duodenoscope for processing is a complex and demanding process that is absolutely critical to safe patient care. And it's often performed by staff who are working in uncomfortable, cramped conditions with tremendous time pressures and not a whole lot of attention from outside the department until the unfortunate day that only 105 out of the 106 necessary tasks were performed perfectly and a patient is exposed to someone else's pathogens. So we have a great opportunity to elevate this critical work in the staff who perform it. And I hope our listeners will come away with some suggestions for how to start. Thank you so much, Aaron, for talking with us today about this amazing research. I think there's definitely some key points um, to take home today about um, duodenoscope reprocessing, but also that apply to, I think, a lot of our healthcare workers out there. Um, so thank you so much for that. And we hope to see more research down the road from you. We are Nikki Shore and Jesse Swain, and this is the American Journal of Infection Control podcast, Science into Practice. Thanks for listening and doing your part to prevent infection, because remember, infection prevention is everybody's business. To hear other AGIC podcast episodes and to access information about this podcast in the field of infection prevention and control, go to our website at agicscienceintopractice.org. That's A-G-I-C, scienceintopractice.org. AJEC Science Into Practice is created by the Association for Professionals in Infection Control and Epidemiology with input from the APIC Research Committee and Pat Stone and Jean Brandt at AJEC and APIC staff, Lisa Tomlinson, Liz Garman, Bobby Golshin, Chris Ruiz, Kelly Lynn Russell, Kaylee Deaton, and Christine Miller. We work in partnership with Human Factor and Audio Tech Blake Alton.